one year anniversary. Yeah, one year, Craig Goss. Well done, my man. It's amazing. Uh, awesome job. Well done, my man. Well done, Gareth. Uh, yeah. I'm very proud of us. Yeah, I'm very proud of us too and proud of you too, man. Thanks so much for this epic journey. And Likewise, um, it's been an epic journey. Yeah, for sure. And we're excited about this week's guest. I'm holding a, even though it's a little cactus <laughs> sort of succulent plant here, we spoke a lot about the environment and the importance of trees. And we had such a good guest, don't we, Craig? Wanjira Mathai was one of the most inspiring women we've ever chatted to. So what an honor for our 52nd episode. So we're super excited to get into this one. Yeah, we are super excited. So much value in this chat. So happy that it's number 52. What a way to finish a year. So yeah. let's uh, hear what it's like for one Jira Mathai to be ridiculously human. <laughs> How's it going? Good, Good morning. How are you? What? Good. Good stuff. Nice to see Thank your you face. so much for joining us. So how's your morning going so far? Bright and early? Yes, it's good. It's good. Mm. Great stuff. So today, okay, Wanjira, am I, am I pronouncing it correctly, Wanjira? Yes, Wanjira. Uh, we also are two South Africans, so we also we feel like a little African bit like... African <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, podcasts a podcast's good... a big thing in Kenya. They are. I was slow to it, right? I'm the one who's uh, just <laughs> catching on. And now I'm binging on some, you know, I haven't any particular ones, but NPR and others that I uh, Oh, cool. But yeah, it is. I, I, I hadn't, I'm a very slow adopter. I'm the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I finally caught on to, yeah, you can literally listen to, um, to just about tons of content on what just exactly what you want. Exactly. That's, amazing, yeah. That's the cool thing is like, it, it's so niche, you know what I mean? Which is amazing. So like, you don't have to listen to just stuff that doesn't interest you. You can go straight in there and find something that's, that you're interested in and appeals to you. Exactly. I think that, that, that for me has been the revelation, but it's not intuitive. <laughs> no, it's not for sure. <laughs> There's just the pronunciation of... Uh, oh, Mathai. Mathai, so it's actually a TH. Almost like my thigh, Mathai. Mathai, I got it, sweet. Yeah. Okay, awesome, that's yeah. really cool. But also the spelling, though. I've seen it spelled um, M-A-A-T-H-A-I. And then right. yours my mother spelled spells it. In, yeah, yes. exactly. There's a backstory that she, she told in her book, which probably, I don't know if I'll, I'll tell the gory details, but it's basically... Uh, she changed the spelling of her surname and so uh -huh. she, she started writing it more phonetically and so uh -huh. in, in Kikuyu the pronunciation is a little bit stretched out so uh -huh. the A is she just wanted to differentiate her name from my dad's name uh -huh. Uh -huh. because of divorce, okay. yeah. uh -huh. interesting interesting mm -hmm. okay Waking at dawn. Back. All right, we are here with Wanjira Mathai. Thank you so much, all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Craig and Gareth. Uh, We're nice. really excited to have you on our on our over having a good conversation with you today. How's your morning going so far? The morning's good. The weather is a bit chilly, but that's good Nairobi fashion. But uh, it's it's a good day. <laughs> oh, great. When Jira, I often think that people don't know what chili is, especially in Africa. Like my, my, <laughs> my folks are in Joburg and they always go, yeah, no, it's so cold. It's like 15 and stuff. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I'm in London. I'm like, that's like summer for us. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I have the same problem with my friends in Europe, especially in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia. But I always try and remind myself that in, in most of the places where it gets colder, you also have a lot better insulation, a lot better heating, and True. the floors are not stone cold. So I do, <laughs> I do stick with my it's cold, even when it's 14 and 15, because it's really bone chilling cold. No, you're right, you're right, definitely. Oh, that's basic. Now, Anjira, it's great to be speaking uh, to another amazing African woman today, making a massive impact in the world. 
And uh, Wanjira, we love to hear people's backstories and like a little bit more about the person before us today. Uh, so let's start about just chatting a little bit about what it's like uh, to live with a mum who's a Nobel, Nobel Peace, Peace Prize winner. Well, you know, what's funny is that she only became a Nobel Peace Prize winner in 2004, and, and I was quite old by then. So it's, it, I think that the backstory is, was quite normal, to be honest, because it was, uh, she was just doing what she did, uh, an environmental activist, and I, I just thought that was her job. And everybody's mother goes to work or father goes to work or their home doing uh, a lot of hard work and that was just what my mother did so i didn't i never thought much of it um, until i was much older mm. uh, and what, what is it like growing up in nairobi did you actually grow up in nairobi or was it i did oh you did cool can you tell us a little yeah. bit about it please yeah, Nairobi, I found Nairobi to be, I mean, maybe now I have a better perspective having lived uh, outside the country and visited many other parts of the world. Nairobi is pretty special. It's, a, it's a 2,000 meters about above sea level. So the, the climate is quite uh, pleasant, very nice, cool mornings, and then, uh, and, and I call them chilly, and then the day could <laughs> just warm up up to, you know, 27, 28, 29 and then start chilling right back down again by, by six o'clock, you're looking for your scarf or your jumper. Or... So it's a really pleasant place to live. I, I, I especially love the weather. It's a lot greener than people expect. A lot of hmm. trees and, and, and so you, you, you drive through these alleys or drive through these avenues of trees almost all over the place. And then again, I love October in Kenya because the jacaranda trees are in hmm. full bloom. And it's Beautiful. the only time, actually, it's the only time in Africa when we think, at least for me in Kenya, when we think about the fact that there are different um, climates and the climate uh, <laughs> differences are really a function of this one tree that is changing uh, and dropping its flowers everywhere. It has this beautiful purple flower. So mm -hmm. that I have always associated with, with Nairobi, but I understand Zimbabwe in Harare, it's about the same. So growing up here was, was a really pleasant. I grew up, my parents were divorced when we were quite young. So we grew up between both homes. And I, I still, despite that, remember really happy, happy days. And, and I, I spent some time with my dad, some time with my mom. And I, I said to a, a friend recently that I have friends who emanate from different circles of my time. Either they would be from my time in, in, uh, in when we lived with my dad and from my time when we lived with my mom more. And so it's, I have this circle of very many friends and the fact that I lived uh, in so many parts of Nairobi. So I had a, a really good, uh, pleasant memories of my life here. Oh, that sounds awesome. I, it sounds a little bit like Johannesburg as well, hey Gareth, because Johannesburg is like 1500 to 1800, I think, meters above sea level yeah. and pleasant, like, you know, pleasant climate. And yeah. we've, we've always said it's like one of the best climates in the world, I'm sure, because exactly. of that fact, you know. Exactly. And the jacarandas, I think, are, are big time in Pretoria, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Yeah. And yeah. Um, really beautiful uh, time. So we're very well aware of how beautiful they are. But tell yeah. us a little bit about the, the, the language you mentioned. Uh, we spoke before the chat a little bit about, you know, your uh, surname and that kind of thing. And uh, tell us, there's, there's a few different dialects and that kind of thing in Kenya. Maybe you yeah, can say can... a few things for us in, uh, in your native tongue. <laughs> That's right. You know, you, uh, Kenya, you, we have about 42 different uh, ethnic groups. And, and they are generally grouped into three Bantu, Nilots, and Kushites but I come from uh, the central part of Kenya, my, my parents, you know, you come from where your parents come from. So I didn't yeah. really <laughs> grow up there, but my, my mother was from an area called Ihide in, in Nyeri, Nyeri County. And that's right at the foothills of Mount Kenya and the upper dares, almost mm -hmm. in between uh, in a valley. And she, her whole life and, and her life's work really, which we'll talk about later, was, was a function of where she grew up and the lush beauty of nature in that area. She writes a lot about it in her book, but that was really where she drew her, her inspiration. And, and for me, a lot of the motivation for why I think working with young people today consciously and very deliberately makes sense, because I remember my mother always referring 
to being a child and playing in nature and playing with tadpoles and feeling that that was where she drew most of her inspiration. So then uh, Nyeri therefore was, is, is, a, is a big part of where I came from. And then um, my father was from an area or is from an area in the Rift Valley called Nakuru, uh, Joro. Uh, and Joro was also, you know, we had pleasant memories of going to, the, to that part, but it's in a different part of the country in the Great Rift Valley uh, region. And that too uh, is, was beautiful. My father was a, a farmer and he had um, a commercial farmer and he had cows and a, a, a farm. He farmed wheat and other crops. And so we spent a lot of time on the farm. I remember as a child, going to the farm and, and wanting to weigh uh, the milk because there were about 30 cows being milked every day, twice a day. And mm. those cows, all that milk was then sent to uh, the cooperative creamery. So he was supplying some of the milk for the bigger um, milk companies. But I remember wanting to go and every cow had a name. Uh-huh. And every, cow, <laughs> every cow was named after a city. And so uh, Naipasha or Nairobi, every <laughs> And my brother and I would be given the responsibilities of recording the weight of how much milk each cow. So, you know, you would hear a voice, Naivasha, five kilos. <laughs> so you had, to, you had to do that. And it was all so much fun. I remember all of that. And I remember times, the one particular time when, when um, I didn't realize, but cows, the cows were largely grass fed. So they would open the, the paddocks and the cows would go out into the farm, which was quite a large farm. And they would come back. It's almost like they came back on their own um, for, for, to go back into their, their pens. But I remember a time when they, there was um, pineapple waste and pineapple skins that was being added to their feed. And mm-hmm. I don't know why. And they ate so much of it. And apparently cows just love pineapple. They uh-huh. ate so much pineapple that the milk started to smell like pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to stop because now the milk from my father's farm was being rejected because it had this smell of pineapple. Anyway, I remember oh. that. Those were really wonderful, wonderful years. We Sounds spent tasty. a few weeks. I know. That's what I thought, pineapple milk. Happy days. <laughs> Happy yeah. days. We spent quite a bit of time in the farms when I was younger. And then we, we stopped going more as my grandparents um, passed. And then we didn't, that was, I realized that was the glue. We went to, to spend time with them. And my father mm. and my mother, the same, wanted us to spend time with our grandparents. And once they were gone, we, we went less and less. And of course, once we left, went to university. And really, I go very rarely. I, I do have... Um, a small house. I go back to Nyeri often, so I, at least I get back there, but not so much to where my grandmother uh, lived. And, and I think that's a function of the fact that we were all united by her presence. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I think we're so lucky, like growing up in Africa and just having access to nature. And, yeah. you know, like when you said now that you, your mom was playing with tadpoles, I was like, I remember doing that as well as a kid. Yeah. It was so much yeah. fun. And it's just, you literally, you're seeing something transform. You know what I mean? You, you actually start understanding nature and growth. And it's such a powerful thing that you don't probably yeah. realize at the time. Exactly. Exactly. And it's only now, see, a lot of those stories I would never have told. I, I never would have thought them interesting or important. And now they, they, re- they remind you of yeah, just how much you are connected and how how little now, and now that I have two young daughters, I'm trying very hard to make sure, you know, that they, you know, they stump around barefoot as much as possible yeah. because that's really, yeah. that's, that's really cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, so how would you say um, ridiculously human in uh, your native tongue? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Could you say it? <laughs> Let me think. I think I need a few minutes to, to, craft, to craft ridiculously human. I'll find, I'll find it. We'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, you, you spoke about your mom and your mom yeah. sounds like just an amazing lady. Um, what, what was she like, like as a person for you? Like, how do you remember her? There's stories of her being really funny and stuff. Did you have a very happy childhood and laugh a lot with her? Yeah. My mother was really funny and, and a lot more later. So I say maybe earlier on in my life, I, find, I found her quite calm. And 
she never quite uh, reacted seriously to anything. Nothing was too serious. You know, we would go to school, come home with a note from the teacher that you did something and you're shaking in your boots. Clearly, this is going to be trouble. And, and it really never fazed her. She would always ask, you know, why do you think the teacher did that? Um, uh, do you agree with uh, the way the teacher uh, said? And then why don't you go back and explain? I remember a specific <laughs> example of my brother who was really um, scared about this teacher who he felt had been uh, treated him unfairly and he was not, uh, he was, he was feeling that this was unfair. And of course she had written in his diary, you know, this was the way it was done. And so he got home and he was really petrified. And I remember my mother said to me, just go back, I'll sign it, but just go back and explain to her because they had a conversation and she said, you know, you have a point, you have a point about why you did what you did. And so she was like that all my life. And even when we were kids, and so this particular teacher, my brother's teacher, became his mentor and really close to him in the end. And I, I said to myself much later that I can imagine a time where they, they would probably have been enemies forever. You know, this teacher hates me and it ruins his experience. But instead, she became, I think she was so surprised that this child had come back and said sorry and, and explained why he did what he did and that he didn't intend to cause any distress. But uh, she was like that, and just constant uh, and very generous and selfless. She was selfless in her public life, but she was very selfless as an individual. She had very um, little need for, 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 um, for stuff, right? She didn't, she didn't buy stuff for herself or do things for herself. She was always doing things for others. Hmm. So she was very kind. She was very... Um, thoughtful I, and, and certainly quite even killed in that way. I also think she was, and then later realized just how funny she was. I worked with my mother for, for 12 years and it was the most hilarious time. I don't think I laughed or, you know, you know how you, you have a person who you call every time you see a joke, you're like, oh my God, I must send this one. I used to, my mother was a part of those. I was like, oh my God, she's going to love this. So um, she was quite. She had a great sense of humor. Oh, that's wow, so cool. that's such an amazing yeah. sort of attribute to have, isn't it? To yeah. to have that know that that's the person that you want to send those funny jokes to is kind yeah. of a, a really cool way to know that someone's funny. You know, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know they'll get it exactly. Yeah. So you you spoke about the beautiful area where where your grandmother and father came from and where your mother lived, uh, and that sort of shaped sort of part of the person that she became. Um, tell us a little bit about the, um, the public spaces uh, in, in uh, Nairobi and that, that she'd kind of put herself at some risk to try and save. What was the situation there? Yeah, those were, you know, later on as, you know, she started the Green Milk Movement in 77 with a group of other women working with her. And then they began to work on, on, restoration of, of, of different landscapes. And it was very clear to her, I guess, that um, trees were the source of so many things. She had made the connection that um, women during a particular conference, preparing for a conference in Mexico, had identified food, fuel, and nutritious food as the three things that they, they were lacking. And a lot, interestingly, these women had come from the same or an area that was quite similar to where she had grown up. So she was quite perplexed by how the time that she was a child, all those things were in plenty. After all, she's the one who fetched the water. She's the one who fetched the firewood. And certainly they never lacked for food. So how, what had happened? And so that was the, when she had the idea, why not plant trees? Let's plant trees. And that was the, the genesis really of the Green Love Movement. And then as the years went on, I would say 77, maybe for 10 years, they continued to just work on tree planting and getting communities to plant trees. And it was only after they started to make the connection between uh, that tree planting and then the, the commons, the public spaces, parks, uh, road reserve, and how important it was to prevent um, erosion of rivers or, or riverbanks by protecting the riverbank with trees. And so, word came to her that, I think this was probably the beginning of the advocacy work of the Green Belt Movement, that there, there was some plan to build a 60-story building on, 
on the main um, park in the middle. It's in, right in, the, in, in downtown Nairobi. It, it's a, a very special space that's jam-packed over the weekend with activities and, hmm. and children running. Every, it's a, quite a sight. Thousands and thousands of people come from other very crowded um, residences where you don't have that space and people will sit there and just spend the whole day. It's really quite nice. And that that was going to disappear was for her uh, an impossible task, you know, over my dead body type of thing. So she started a campaign, which she thought was quite, uh, I would imagine she never knew the, the extent of, of the politics involved. Uh, it was probably the first time when she realized that. I, I always say the, polit the, the environmental became political here because the, here was an a clearly environmental space that was under assault. So she thought it was quite easy. You just, uh, we make this objection. I don't imagine the, the Green Belt movement thought it was easy, but they felt it was straightforward. You make the connection, This we need this park. And they started a campaign to protect it, but very quickly they found out, well, this was actually backed by the head of state at the time. And it was uh, a 60 story building was part of his project for his political party. And there was gonna be a four story, um, skyscraper it was going to be a four-story high statue of himself so this was not a joke and so they decided that, that that was unacceptable to do in a park like that and then subsequently found out that there was a, there's a what there's an aquifer under there so of course to sustain a 60-story building you have to go so deep and it would it would just have destroyed the whole place and so they started a, and sustained a, a campaign that gained a lot of momentum. And that's the thing with some of these campaigns, you don't know, right? You don't know if people will resonate. Uh, you need the solidarity of the masses to sustain. Otherwise, you cannot do it alone. Nobody can. So they, they fortunately were joined by the religious community. There's a church that sits on that, on that part. They were joined by general public. And it would just became a massive campaign. And she had used, she found out the, through the Green Belt Movement, they had found out that the, the financiers of this was a UK based um, uh, financier. So they directly started talking about the parallels with London and how can you do this to Uhuru Park when you would never do it to Hyde Park. You know, yes. that sort of <laughs> Great. So, and why would you come and fund the destruction of Uhuru Park? And, and uh, so you, in the end, to credit to that campaign, interestingly, before I say that, the, the, all of this was done quite formally. It was letter writing, letters that you can mm -hmm. actually read today. You can, we're wow. working on, uh, one of the things the Wangai Mathai Foundation wants to do is to share some of these uh, backstories and, and the letters. So you can see the letters that she was writing to the ambassador, the UK ambassador, wow. high commissioner, and saying, you know, this, can you direct this to, to this particular person? And then also to the government, to the president, to the parliament, everything just very formally done for the record and for the, pub, for the general public. But in, in the course of all of that, I think the financier pulled out. So the, the, the funding disappeared. And that was the beginning of the end of that project. Um, and it never did happen. And today, you, you know, you realize just how important that was in raising environmental consciousness in this country. People are now, you would never see that happen today. You cannot fence a park and then start digging it up. Uh, and people don't show up in large numbers. Uh, and, and a lot of people depend, their livelihoods depend on that, on that, um, on that park. So that was the, a major park and multiple others followed. There was um, that Zuhuru Park, there was Karura Forest, which was an even more dramatic uh, year long or more campaign to save what is now understood to be the second largest urban forest in the world, sitting mm. in the middle of Nairobi, I think 1400 hectares. And it's a beautiful forest. And uh, at the time was, was a no-go zone. You know, it was a dangerous forest. You're not to be seen walking there. Today, it's the most visited place in Nairobi for recreation. It's a mm. beautiful forest. People are running, riding bikes. Uh, playing uh, all sorts of games. And it's just a beautiful haven um, that has been transformed. And again, that is another legacy of, of my mother's work. Wow, that's so awesome. Like, I mean, so powerful indeed, you know, and, and actually just listening to you speak now, I'm like, 
I really want to come to Nairobi and go visit yeah. the parks. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, I'm a massive fan yeah. of trees as it yeah. is. So I don't need yeah. any reason. Yeah. Other reason. So I really would like to get there. So talking yeah. about trees, one of the initiatives I think is that your mom wanted to plant like a million trees and this is like spread around the world. Can you just tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, there actually was an interesting um, conversation she had with a friend who said, why don't we plant a million trees? And, and she looked at that person, she says, a million? The Greenbelt <laughs> movement has already planted 50 million. So the idea was um, to go to a billion. And so it actually very quickly moved <laughs> from a million trees and it became the billion tree campaign. This is the global yeah. campaign that started. Um, I believe it was in 2006, seven there. And the United Nations Environment um, hosted that campaign. So it was called the Billion Tree Campaign. And it was a campaign to inspire people around the world to plant trees and record them in uh, um, a database that the UN had, was hosting. Mm. And people did, it was very interesting. You had people from all over the world recording, I planted 10 trees, I planted 20 trees, I planted two trees, you know, whatever they wow. did they recorded and very quickly um, it became a billion trees. And obviously we don't know where those trees were planted, whether they were planted or someone saying, I intend to plant 20 trees, did they plant them? But that was in many ways besides the point because in the end, it just galvanized people. There were billion trees committed or planted um, from around the world. And that database was able to, to monitor and follow where those trees were. So that was, um, it was a fantastic uh, campaign and awareness raising campaign. Uh, and then UNEP, I think, felt it was time to wind that campaign down or pass it on. And they passed it on to a fantastic young German activist. He's, uh, I mean, he was 10 years old at the time, believe it or not. I think he's now, I'm told he's probably 17, 18, doing his PhD somewhere in Germany. But he is uh, an inspiring young, young uh, man called Felix. And Felix essentially took the campaign on and started, uh, changed the name to Plant for the Planet. So if you look at uh, online for Plant for the Planet, you'll find his work and you'll probably see him. Uh, and he just started raising awareness about um, the importance of planting trees with children, particularly telling children, this is your future. Um, he also started a campaign about stop talking, start acting or start planting. <laughs> and he would always cover the mouths of, you know, you'd see him with his hands over the, the mouth of the UN Secretary General or something, just really uh, <laughs> very striking images. And again, raising awareness and consciousness about the urgency for action. And then he, he um, I'm told, he started what he called a youth academy, which is, was, was uh, just a, an interaction with kids where he would offer seminars around climate change. And I heard him speak about climate and all of that because he was so young, people would say, really? He was the real deal. I mean, he definitely is one of the most inspiring activists for climate and climate leaders. And he's so, he was so young then, he's, he's a little older now, but he's still at it, you know, he's still doing it. And I met his father here in Nairobi last week when there was a conference on global landscape restoration. And he was still, you know, he kept, he gave us a really good update. Felix is still passionate and crazy about this. And so he, 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 the work continues. And so they've morphed, you know, we reached a billion trees and it became a trillion trees. I think wow. they're now at a trillion trees trying right. to just get people to, to mobilize and plant and, and not get tired. Yeah. Oh, I'm just blown away hearing the story, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well. so, really? so I mean, he is ridiculously human. Yeah, you've given us a new guest. That's, <laughs> yeah, we're going to chat to Felix, that's for sure. How did Felix actually get involved? Like, how, was he just, did he just cotton on to this idea through seeing your mother's work or...? I think so. I would have to go back and see exactly where the connection was. But he was in the in those circles. He used to come to meetings wow. always with at his 10. father at 10. His father wow. is, I mean, the true hero uh, was his father who made sure that he didn't stifle him. I mean, can you imagine? You, he followed him 
everywhere. He was with that boy to protect. He was 10 years old. Make sure that he didn't falter. He didn't get taken advantage of. But he allowed him to, to go and learn and, and be inspired and continue this thing that, you know, his father was probably trying to still figure out what it was. He was his greatest uh, cheerleader. And it, I, I always admire, I admire that a lot. Wow, it's yeah, incredible. I think it'd be amazing. <laughs> No, yeah. you know, the, your mother's obviously done a lot of amazing things. Did, 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 was this part of the rise to the Nobel Peace Prize? Or well, tell us a little bit about that journey and, and what it was like to, and what sort of changed when she, after, she, after she'd received that? Yeah. No, you know, the interesting thing is I, I, I had an epiphany many years ago and I tell people this, but it's hard to believe, right? I, I, will, I remember when I finally understood what my mother does and how much she puts herself at risk. I remember once saying to myself, oh my goodness, and nobody will probably ever know that she does all this. It's sort of, you put so much, it's so important nationally, it's so significant but wow, you could do all this and nobody ever knows you're doing it. And then of course, many, many years later, it was just a brainwave I remember having and thinking. And then when she got the Nobel Peace Prize, I think the path to that was just how she was able to connect. Uh, first of all, that she was such a, a, a ridiculously human environmentalist. I mean, she was crazy about the environment. She understood the environment so profoundly. I mean, there are two, two stories that I often tell. One time I was with her in the Congo Basin, so much after she received the Nobel Peace Prize, she was asked to be the global ambassador for the Congo Basin, a goodwill ambassador for the Congo Basin forest ecosystem, which covers 11 countries in Central Africa. And so we went, I know, can you imagine the massive uh, yeah. forest, they call it Africa's lungs, right? And so the forest, we went to visit um, the forest. I think we were in uh, Congo, in Brazzaville. And we went in and this, one of the projects that she was visiting was someone who was sustainably harvesting um, timber. And he took her to see how he harvests uh, mature trees. And of course the Congo is vast. And here were these massive trees and how he chops them down and then how he, retrieves whatever he can, the, the timber, and how they then use uh, the leftovers. And he was trying to show, it was about 30% becomes timber, 60% goes to waste. And so it can either go up in flames or you can use it for something else. <laughs> My mother stood there in tears as those trees came down. And I thought to myself, this is really powerful that she, re her reaction to seeing this 200 year old tree fall was unbearable. She said, you know, I think she was just feeling like, is that really necessary for a chair? You know, so she's, I think that, that profound connection to nature was for me amazing. I was a, an observer often in moments like that where I would sit and I'd think, oh my goodness. And also a lot of my own passion for, for the environment or my own appreciation for, came from her. You know, we would be traveling in a place like Japan, which is pristine. You know, you're, dry, you're in this train and you're going and all you see is forests and forests and forests and no, no soil exposed. And she clued me into the fact that when, a, when the soil is exposed, it's almost like a, a, a wound. You know, you need to take care of it. You need to cover it. It's bleeding. And she was just, I mean, that, that kind of... Uh, power in her understanding and her drive to protect nature. So I always, every time I would see soil, I would think of a bleeding wound. <laughs> You'd think, oh my God, this must be really painful. And she would tell me, take that picture, take pictures. And she would always be um, alert to what she saw. So I got exposed over 12 years every day of hearing her um, just it was not a show. It was real for her. It was powerfully real. And she was connected in ways I don't think I will ever see. And certainly I had never seen. And so her environmental activism was easy because it, was, it came from so deep inside. It was almost, it was part and parcel of who she was. And the fact that she was able to make that connection between environment, 
democracy in how she started to talk about the metaphor of a three-legged stool that if you, uh, she always said, you can, the most important uh, department within a government is the environment department. And she always talked about how it gets the least amount of budget, but it's the most important because the environment you need to survive, but the environment doesn't need you. The environment would be just fine mm. if you disappeared. And she would always make those connections and make people understand that you need this environment for all the other things you need to do for water, for agriculture, for all of that. A healthy environment supports healthy people. And then she said, that she, she had this metaphor of um, the three-legged stool. And the three-legged stool was how she said it was all one piece and it was all uh, carved out by masterful craftspeople who, who knew that they had to create these three legs to support the seat. And the one leg was uh, the sustainable management of the environment. The other leg was... Um, democratic space, an expanding democratic space, and the other leg was peace. And with those three nicely firmly in place, you can sit and you won't fall, mm. you would not um, be unstable. And the extent to which you have a stable society, a stable country, depends on the stability of those three pillars. And that, that became for her a huge metaphor for why the environment is a critical part of, of stability and peace. And that's exactly what the Nobel Committee recognized. And if you read the citation, it was about the connection that she made with democracy, peace, and the environment. So powerful and so inspiring indeed. And like, yes, right up our alley for sure. It's yeah. really made me yeah. want to like, get even more involved, I guess, in you know, the whole yeah. environment, because it's so important. Sure. No, literally. And, and exactly. what you said is so so true like w the world will always exist and it's always going to sort of carry on you know it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if we want to pollute it as much as we want the, it somehow it will overcome that you know we're just going to yeah. mess things up for ourselves which is so stupid exactly um, so just just kind of moving on from there a little bit um it's really interesting actually uh recently on facebook i've seen a couple of videos talking about forests and I swear it's AI working at its best, knowing that we were going to talk to you. <laughs> um, one of these, one of these videos was showing, I don't know where it was. I, I think it was somewhere in Africa. So this couple uh, tried to help with the orange peel wastes that were just getting thrown away. Like, you know, just they were getting burnt or whatever the story was. And they were like, instead of throwing it away, let's just plant it in this piece of land. Yeah. Which is quite arid. And they did that and then went back like sort of, you know, 15, 20 years later. And it was just this, this amazing new forest. Like it's, it's just kind of, you know, grown because of these, uh, they'd kind of fertilized, I guess, the soil and stuff with orange peels. And it was really like an amazing video. But off the back of that, deforestation is a big issue. And it's happening in so many places, you know, and I, I don't think enough focus is probably on it in the in the public uh, spotlight um, but it is going to impact us at some point is there anything that is currently getting done about this is there there must be like a positive movement you know and some positive aspects of it um, yeah. do you know you know what is happening yes yeah. Yes, a lot is happening. Um, it really is an interesting time for, for forests. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate really to serve as the co-chair of a movement called the Global Restoration Council. And, and that's a council of um, enthusiastic uh, forest uh, restoration um, individuals who are trying to mobilize resources and, and activity and attention to exactly what you mentioned. But really, I mean, it, just to create, to, to, to start from um, sort of the macro picture, you have the, the UN Forest Declaration. There's a whole UN um, declaration that forests are important and that we must restore up to four, 350 million hectares by 2030. Wow. So there's a huge movement that has been created by this momentum by the UN and the movement is somewhat 
crystallizing around regions. So you have in, in Latin America, there's an initiative called 20 by 20, uh, restoring 20 million hectares by 2020. So that's Latin America's contribution to the UN Forest Declaration. So this is, it's important because everybody looking at this big number started to ask, okay, so what shall we do? And in Africa, we're really fortunate to have had the African Union endorse a movement called AFR 100. And AFR 100 is essentially a country-led movement that is triggering restoration in different countries. And countries are essentially making commitments. AFR 100 had a target. The target was 100 million hectares by 2030. That can we get Africa to commit to up to 100 million hectares. That is a contribution to the big 350 million. Africa's wow. contribution would be a third of that. And how would that be distributed across countries? And you will be surprised. The meetings we had two weeks ago in Nairobi, we are now at 97 million hectares wow. of the 100 pledged, right? No way. So you have countries from up north all the way down south committing making real commitments for restoration so in kenya for example kenya made a commitment to restore by 2030 uh, 5.1 million hectares hmm. ethiopia the biggest contribution 15 million hectares wow. tanzania 5.2 million hectares and this is a fantastic mosaic of countries who have said this is what we'll do. This is what we'll do. This is what we'll do. And all that put together comes to 96, close wow. to 96 million. So we are close to 100 million hectares in pledges. Wow. Now, the big story is how do we convert those pledges into real action on the ground? So for Kenya, where are those 5.1 million hectares? And can we start restoring them? 2030 is around the block. It's not yeah. that far away. <laughs> So yeah. that's now the phase that we are going into. We've made the pledges. And when we were starting this campaign, there were many people who said, oh, I don't believe it. This is impossible. Will Africa commit 100 million hectares? Well, they committed 100 million hectares. And now they're moving from commitments to actual implementation. And if we can get the implementation done, I know that it will be one of the biggest success stories in, this, in the history of restoration. Now imagine this, in Kenya we have 5.1 million hectares that are going to be restored. And Kenya has now started mapping out where those 5.1 million hectares are. And deciding in Mount Kenya, there'll be 2 million in, in Mount Elgon, this is it. As, long, as soon as you have that, they start to think about, so what shall be the, the what, what shall we do? Shall we restore forests? Shall we uh, create new forests? Is this gonna be riverine restoration? All the uh, croplands, and what we also have a lot in, in the drier areas are rangelands, and the restoring of rangelands is very much a part of landscape restoration. Don't forget this is landscapes, not only forests. And so there's a huge movement in Africa that is being driven by NEPAD, which is um, the, the main uh, AU agency that's driving this. But there are multiple partners, technical partners, uh, local organizations, and then you have these 27 countries that have put um, some very ambitious commitments forward. And I, I have to say, uh, one of the things that is really inspiring is that uh, organizations, international organizations, like one that I serve on a senior, as a senior advisor for forest restoration, the World Resources Institute, have leveraged whatever resources they have uh, in terms of um, um, technical, especially these are technical partners to help these countries prepare, map, um, understand the, the, the restoration potential and restoration capacity. So they've literally been um, leveraging to make sure that this campaign is a success. So the recipe for success is there. We have the coordination uh, through NEPAD. We have international and local organizations working together. We need to mobilize millions and millions of dollars for this sort of work. But mm. the, the pieces are there. So to your point about what's happening is there's a massive movement that's being driven. And one of the things that I'm excited about is that in the next few months, we're going to start seeing um, a more granular understanding of this 100 million hectares. We're going to see landscapes. So people, countries will start identifying landscapes 
that they want restored. So it will be this landscape, this landscape. So we're starting at WRI, at the World Resources Institute, we're starting with the 100 uh, landscapes. We're trying to populate 100 landscapes across Africa that are slated for restoration. And then it starts to become real, right? Instead of just this big number, you start yeah. to see, oh, this is Mount Kenya, or oh, this is uh, the Drakenbergs, or so, you know, mm. or oh, this is this the Serengeti. They want to restore a part of it. That's and then the Great Green wow. Wall, um, which is the semi-arid areas uh, that need restoration. And a lot of these areas just need terracing. They need soil to be able to collect so that stuff grows. As soon as you lose the soil, you lose all capacity to grow anything. And so that's, that's it's a huge, fantastic movement. Join it. Wow. Yes. I'm, I'm pumped. So seriously, I'm also so, excited about it. Wow. So along with the, the, the topsoil is the, the magic right there. So, right. so once you've sort of regained some of the um, soil that's usable, then do you actually go and plant? Is that part of the process in terms of restoration? It's not always planting. Planting is one. You have um, farmer managed natural regeneration, which just means um, farmers help. You know, you often you will see a tree has been cut and it starts to shoot again. Um, yeah. There are many there are many places where there's a lot of biological diversity still latent in the soil. That if they, if you just allow it, it will come. So there's enclosures. Sometimes you just avoid going to a particular area and oh. trees come because they are there. Yeah. One of the most interesting stories uh, is captured in a, in a docu documentary called Ethiopia Rising. It tells a story of restoration that happened in the Sahel, in the Sahel of Ethiopia, in an mm -hmm. area called Tigray. And that restoration story is fascinating. 20 years it took. So this is not a quick stint. It's a 20 year story where they restored a million hectares of land. So essentially people moving uh, rocks to create terraces. There were a lot of research, a lot of universities bringing in, especially Bekele University right there in Tigray, bringing in their research, creating um, water collection systems. And over 20 years, today that place is an absolute oasis and it was a basket cake. Wow. And so I, I went, so I, I'm talking about things I saw. It was unbelievable <laughs> to see. And that's the sort of thing that restoration, it's a, it's a mosaic of interventions. It's tree planting, yes. It's terracing so that, you know, some trees are dispersed by birds or by animals, but you need mm -hmm. the soil there. So when you terrace, soil collects, and then by, the seeds are dropped and it comes. So a lot of that can happen on its own. There are multiple different um, methodologies or interventions that can happen when the political will is there the decision is made to that restoration will happen and what sort of restoration will happen that's so exciting wow it's, it really I, mean, it's, I mean and actually you know experiencing that and seeing it yourself must be yeah. incredible wow. I, exactly. I, was, I was watching something a while ago on youtube and it was they were talking about chernobyl and they were showing, they were saying that actually there now plants are starting to grow again too. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. You know what I mean? That's amazing. Not Nature yeah. finds a way. Nature will yeah. always overcome things. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. and I think one of the amazing things about uh, all these sort of uh, developments and building new forests and stuff is like, we don't even know the implications of a lot of things. So like, I'm sure you can tell us a bit about, say, you know, the wildlife and the animals and, and you know, everything that's, that's just going to come back as well as a result. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take that long, right? And I think, you know, I've, I've traveled a little bit in Scandinavia. And one of the things that has really struck me is just how much easier Africa has it if we paid attention. I mean, I went to, <laughs> I, I noticed uh, in, in Sweden, I'm told uh, it takes 90 years for a tree to mature. Can you imagine? 90. Crazy. In which, which means in anybody's lifetime, they see one tree mature. Yeah. Hmm. Most of us, from down there where you are to up north, we are so privileged. It takes 30 years for a tree to mature. Hmm. In Kenya, most likely the same there in South Africa. So can you imagine what 
a Swede is thinking when you say you have no trees and you can plant three trees, you can mature trees three times faster than them. Huh. That has got to be for me one of the starkest reminders that we cannot be complacent. We have it so much better in a way. Hmm. Yet our landscapes are vastly degraded. It's a lot of greed, selfishness, and apathy that we just have to get over because there is no other reason because it's certainly not the climate that we cannot uh, reforest or ensure that we have our 10% forest cover, which is the minimum. We have got to get with the program. How mm. can Scandinavia be sending us timber? A friend of mine recently told me that yeah. they're importing timber from Sweden. And I thought, wow, we should be sending Sweden timber during the <laughs> 90 <laughs> years as they yeah. wait. Wow. Yeah, it's so it's, it really is. The opportunities for Africa are great and the movement needs to, to, to be energized. We need young people involved. But it's just real issues like that. 90 years? Are wow. you kidding? Yeah, wow. When you, before we move on to, to the youth and that kind of thing, I was just thinking, you know, we're sitting here uh, in a city. Um, I, I feel removed from a forest, if you know what I mean. Like a forest sounds, yeah. feels like a thing... What is, what is the importance of forests, even to the city slicker, you know, and, and how does it affect humanity, let's say, or a country yeah. at large? Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest challenges, especially for cities like ours, is pollution. I mean, you have, um, I have young children, one who's pre-asthmatic, and it's every day. You, you know that every time they are breathing in, they are breathing in all sorts of toxins. And, and our ability to control uh, persistent pollutants in the air and what is there has a lot to do with the state of our environment. Um, it's not a mistake that people say uh, trees are the lungs of, of, the, of a city. You need green spaces to, to be able to have livable cities. We soon will be moving out of our cities if we, if we don't take good care of the green spaces. They are not just real estate waiting to be developed. I think the, that that was the big reality in Beijing. They've, they decided, my goodness, this is not sustainable. People couldn't breathe. Uh, and then they started to, to look at the environmental impacts and what needed to happen. So I think for us city slickers, we need to remember that even on the most basic day, if it's hot, you will go under a tree for shade. So at a minimum, you need that tree for shade, fruit, everything that it does. But I think most important for those of us who understand and those of us who are involved in, in environmental or in policy making, that it actually is about survival. I said it a bit earlier, my favorite little sentence, a healthy environment supports healthy people. On the most basic level, you have got to at least ensure that you don't have puddles of water pooling so that mosquitoes breed and malaria spreads. Mm -hmm. You've got to ensure that water ends up going into the underground aquifers so they come back to us as rivers, not as floods that cause landslides and, and flooding in cities. Then you can't get home. The reality. I said to a friend of mine the other day, climate change is a very intellectual uh, conversation. <laughs> but when we had rains in Nairobi in March, and cars were being washed away, buses were being washed away, I said, now there is climate change. That's the one we want <laughs> to talk about. Why is that happening? Why is water rushing in such large volumes? How are we building and planning our cities? How are we, um, how, how, why is this water not staying up in the forest and, and go, coming to us as organized rivers? There's a reason, there's a problem, and these are the symptoms of that problem. So I think in cities, we are going to suffer quite a lot, but we may not necessarily always make the connection that it's coming from upstream, and the damage done upstream often manifests itself downstream. <laughs> Powerful. Pretty <Be> deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, d d just, just, just literally before we move on to you know, this amazing new... Uh, initiative not new but like initiative that you work on with yeah. helping the youth um just regarding climate change it's it's obviously like it's a huge thing right and and it's clear that 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 things are changing you know like in my in my sort of lifetime i noticed that seasons are changing you know in the different countries i've lived yeah. and 
there's a big focus of course on pollution which is terrible and like everyone must do the absolute most you know that they can to stop that in their own little way right and spread that too uh, because we want to live in a healthy like you said environment Mm -hmm. um do you also think that uh maybe there's not enough focus on other things that are impacting it, you know, the environment and climate change too. Like the main focus is on pollution, but then there's bigger forces that are, you know, here too. So we're talking about like the energy of the sun, for example, you know, that's apparently that goes in cycles. And at the moment it's, it's going in a down cycle. There's things like volcanoes, which can impact environments for many, many years, you know, that we don't necessarily put the focus on. So, do you like what is your you know i guess like two minute kind of synopsis on those things yeah no i agree with you there's so much um that that is that plays in into into what's happening is energy and, and how we um use energy and how how cars i mean transportation and how we we decide and choose to to move around but i think that a lot of that also comes down to to the vision of, of our leaders. What's the leadership that allows um, certain things to thrive? I, I'm always inspired by leaders who decide to do the unconventional thing. That the, the, there's a story about uh, Rwanda where the, the head of state said, "We may be a poor country, but we certainly have uh, self-respect." So we will not live in filth. We shall clean these streets of Kigali and everywhere in Rwanda once a month, everybody gets out and cleans up because that does not cost anything. So in a way, it's that leadership that that will get us there, um, controlling the the level of pollution and not allowing um, the kind of spewing of pollutants into the air. Uh, prioritizing renewable energy and a renewable energy pathway. We live on the Sun Belt. Surely we should take more advantage and begin to explore what it looks like to to have more solar uh, energy than um, thinking about some of the more thermal uh, fuel-based uh, energy. So I agree. I mean, there's a lot of, of, of um, alternatives and certainly it's not as simple as pollution only or uh, Mm. energy only. But for me, the biggest piece is leadership. Uh, We need the right leadership, committed leadership that decides this is unacceptable for my people. Let's do something. Even if we have to create our own solution, um, let's start somewhere. Yeah. Um, Yes. I I saw, I saw on Facebook, sorry, Craig, I saw on Facebook Mm -hmm. um, that exact thing that you spoke about in Rwanda, like literally like Mm -hmm. last week. And it was a video of, uh, yeah, the the people cleaning up the streets and, that, and yeah. just the the sort of you know impact it's just had on the community yeah. and brought everyone together. And I was like, how can you know, like, no disrespect to Rwanda, but like, how can Rwanda get this right, but we can't get this right in like yeah. these more sophisticated, you know, more sophisticated and yeah. inverted economies yeah. uh, countries? Like, right. wow, what a what a way to do things it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it starts to transform you as a Rwandese and your own perception of yourself. Yeah. And then the confidence starts to build. Mm. And then you really believe in your ability. Nothing yeah. is impossible. You go places, people are talking about, have you been to Kigali? Yes. And you get a little bit taller. Yeah, it, wow. it does all add up. And, and that's why uh, a lot of this work on, on, on confidence and courage, a lot of being, being um, providing that personal leadership comes from stuff like this. It's not the big things. It's just like, yeah, just mm-hmm. have a sense of self-respect and clean up around you then, and stop living in filth. I mean, can you imagine by the time the head of state decided enough is enough? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I love that. I love that it starts with self-respect. You know, like they always say, you know, charity starts at home. And, and I think it's clever to, to start those initiatives because it does start with yourself, with self-respect, caring for the environment that you're in and even if it's a slightly selfish thing, it grows from a selfish thing to a community thing to a bigger picture thing, which is which exactly. is such a clever way to do it. So you spoke mm-hmm. about leadership a moment ago and just moving forward, your focus nowadays is obviously on nurturing sort of a culture of integrity and purpose with the youth of today, especially in your mm-hmm. country. So tell us a little bit more about your work with the Wangari mm-hmm. Mathai yeah. Foundation. 
Yeah. I mean, you were right. It's a relatively new initiative. Um, two years ago, we set up the Wangari Mathai Foundation to, to look at, at ways of leveraging the story of her life and work uh, more. Um, the Greenbelt Movement clearly remains the flagship story, uh, the flagship legacy to the environment. And then there's also the Wangari Mathai Institute at the University of Nairobi that is uh, nurturing future PhD and master students who are not only knowledgeable book knowledge, but they also have experience by the time they leave, they're actually practicing and have a much deeper sense of praxis. But um, the Wangari Mathai Foundation, we felt uh, we needed to do something that would leverage exactly what we're talking about. Who was she? Why was she the way she was? What did she, what guided her? Uh, to do, yes, environment or democracy uh, peace work. But there were, if we look at the backstory, that would be instructive, perhaps even inspiring to young people as they think about their own lives. And, and every time we would turn around and we had a survey, Kenyan saying who they most admire, she would always emerge uh, at the top um, of the list with, with uh, uh, many others. But I think the foundation's focus was very deliberate, that we focus on young people. And it was a time when uh, a survey had come out, the East African Youth Survey, that showed that young people were 80% of Kenya's population under the age of 35. Can you, I, 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 wow. I refuse to believe that because that means I'm not yeah. young anymore. <laughs> but the, the truth of the matter is, there are a majority of them and a much fewer of the rest of us and that they are the future, period. And the, some of what they exhibited, their fear of standing up for what they believe in, their belief that corruption is legitimate in its, as a way of doing business, were a bit disturbing. And then also the exact antithesis of who Angari Mathai was. And so we thought, wow, this is an opportunity to leverage her story to change that narrative. And so that's when we set up uh, the foundation with those three strategic priorities, the Wangari Muta Mathai House, going to eventually be a center for, for inspiration and action, which inspires young people to, to action by seeing and hearing about her story. We have plans, hopefully, to put up, a, um, it's not a museum, we, we're calling it more of a center that will probably have many other activities going on in addition to display the Nobel Prize and other things for people to, to enjoy. But um, then we have two programs that we've started. Um, the house is still a, a project, a slow burner, but the, the projects we've begun, in particular, Wanakesho, which is, uh, Wanakesho is a Swahili word that means the children of tomorrow. And um, so we've, in the Wanakesho program is a deliberate leadership building, um, uh, we're calling it personal, build, personal leadership and character building project, working with kids in schools between the ages of 10 to 17, and putting them through what we believe is really a stellar leadership program that is teaching uh, personal leadership, it's teaching um, uh, negotiation, and, and focusing on eight core values that were drawn from uh, Wangari Mathai's life, the courage and confidence, which, which she was, resilience, you know, you can fail but get up again, and the power of commitment, patience, and persistence, and um, integrity, uh, you saw that, and, and uh, the list is there. But I think the core uh, point is that anchored on these eight values, we can begin to build deliberately um, people of character and, and confidence that would then take us, usher us into the future. And I'm really privileged that this work is resonating with so many people, schools that we're going to start uh, implementing this program in January in a number of schools, but we have a fantastic partner, partnerships with uh, an education outfit in Nairobi and uh, uh, creative designs, because we're trying to do some very interesting and fun um, materials, but also with an emotional intelligence outfit that is called Six Seconds, that is looking at some of the methodology and how we monitor the impact of this sort of work. That if we can show that it does make a difference to teach confidence, patience, mm -hmm. uh, to teach uh, showing up, that part of partner mm -hmm. leadership is being, stepping up to the plate, showing up and being smart when you do it. Don't come half-heartedly and doing everything you do 
with the fullest intention that it, it matters. And imagine if everybody does it. And the truth is, Wangai Mathai, Nelson Mandela, I love that photograph behind you. Well, they were individuals. But so you don't need a battalion of people. So if we can get just one, we've succeeded. But we need to see if this makes a difference, that you pass through uh, quite deliberately a program that is focused on personal leadership and character building. <laughs> That is so awesome. I'm, I'm like so fired up for it. So like yeah. thinking it, it is such a necessity for this, you know, like all around the world. Um, how do you stop a kid or not stop a kid, but how do you sort of shift the kids thinking from wanting to be like a YouTuber to wanting to just like be a better leader? You know, like these are probably the, the struggles you might be having. Um, how, how do you kind of go about that? Yeah, it's actually less about stopping them from doing one thing to doing the other thing. It's just whatever you do, do with the fullest intention not to harm others. Just do it for the right reasons. And maybe the YouTube will become not the YouTube will become will it will fall off the list once you start prioritizing. But it's just that you become a better version of that. That YouTuber is really there because it, it has a role that you do, right? It, yeah. Whatever you're doing, do it with the fullest intention. And then when you're done, make sure that you offer service. Service to others uh, is another um, of the values we're teaching. And so by the time they decide that YouTube is the place, that they go there with the best of intentions to transform. Yeah, that I, makes sense. I love, I love that you're using... Like you said earlier, actually, you touched on it, uh, Onjira, is that you're using an individual human being story to drive a whole narrative, to drive a whole program of, of people. And it just shows yeah. you how important people's stories are, a good people's stories. You know, we should right. tell them more. And, and obviously, like, it's just so, we've got to really celebrate the people like your mom and Nelson Mandela and that more, actually, mm -hmm. because it's just, it they had the potential within them and they weren't okay i'm going to sound a bit controversial but they weren't special necessarily like we all theoretically can have something in us that can can make a difference to lots of other people in a good way so i just yeah. think it's a cool really cool message and talking about one thing we can all do one thing that we actually saw was um a clip by that oprah actually had put up about um, my little thing and and it's a, I won't, I won't get too much into it. You can explain it, but it's just basically based on your mom's thing that she, about planting trees and that it's her little thing that she could do. But maybe you could tell us a bit more about that sort of movement at the time. Yeah, you know, the, the, the My Little Thing campaign was part of launching the foundation and saying that each of us can do something, the power of one. That if you, if we put our minds to whatever your little thing is, but as long as you have some little thing, um, it could be in journalism, it could be in, in, in the work that you do, the legal profession, wherever you are, what is your little thing? And, and if you don't know, just get in the business of finding out what that is. And we do that even with kids. We tell them, what's your little thing? You need to have a little thing. Well, then, at this moment, it would be taking care of my cat. And you just do, yeah, let it be taking care of your cat. But you start to, you begin to plant into those minds that you have to have a little thing. It's not an option. Find your little thing and do it. And so that, that I, um, is something that emerged from uh, my mother's statement that, my little thing is planting trees. And so we said, everybody has a little thing. And we started that campaign, it was viral. It went all over the place. And we were privileged to have um, Ms. Winfrey uh, get, tell us her little thing and, and that everybody has uh, a little thing. That's such a, I mean, that's such a big thing for Oprah yeah. to mention, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. It's awesome. Yeah, it was really yeah, awesome. Sure. And, and you, you're, the building that you're in, like I just want, you know, we've, I think, I don't know if it's just like uh, someone's put it together or if it is the actual building that you have. Like, it looks amazing, like um, in the forest and it's like this kind of round shape. Is, is oh, that... that's the dream. Oh, oh my goodness. The dream. That's the okay, dream. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had some fantastic, actually South African architect, uh, Bugatman and partners, gave their time and envisioned what the Wangai Mutamathai house 
could be. And it's, um, it's a lovely dream, that one. And I think it will, it will probably be much different than that. Our thinking has evolved since, but we love that image of, of the, the forest and yeah. the circle and being able to be inside and out. But um, ultimately, it's where we end up will be a function of what's needed. Um, how are the programs evolving? Is our thinking still the same? And, and where can we partner with others to leverage uh, this message? So, um, yeah, I hope, it, I hope that dream is realized, but that's the dream. Yeah. Uh, that's so cool. And what drives you? What keeps you going? What, what is your passion and, and where does it all come from inside of you specifically? You know, I, I often think about that and I think, uh, quite frankly, I just felt so privileged to have been able to spend 12 years with my mother every single day. I know people who just don't and I was living and working in the US very happily and whatever drew me to come back to Kenya was really the, the greatest decision I made and there were many voices saying, "Don't why would you yeah. leave? the U.S. to go back to Kenya. And I was just drawn to go back. And maybe that, that was why I, um, I just felt a sense of gratitude and uh, to my mother for the, you know, and like, I, I really like what you said, Nelson Mandela, Wangai Mathai, they were not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. They struggled with the real issues. Um, she must have, now that I have a family, I know it must have been really tough for her uh, and my father to, to be having the difficulties they were, but through all of that, to have had space to give to others, to have had space to, to do not for yourself only, um, for me overcomes uh, all the many, many imperfections that she had. And I, I always say um, that I, I just feel like a sense of gratitude. I was with her every single day, every day. You know how you hear your parent is sick and that's when you rush to their bedside or to their side. And if you're lucky, they manage to pull out and, and then you're like, oh my goodness, thank goodness I was here. Or if you're unfortunate, they don't make it. And, and so rarely in our advanced ages, after you leave your house, after you leave home, you never go back. You visit, mm -hmm. yes. But, you know, they want you to be happy, go and see the world, do what you're doing. But at the end of the day, to have been able to be there, work with my mother, see and learn from her, get infected really by her passion, in the ways that I explained to you earlier, was a privilege. So I feel like uh, uh, a sense of, of gratitude and a sense that I want to, the work that I want to do, especially in the foundation, that work resonates really deeply for me. How do we unpack that story and, and continue to keep her light shining? I, that, that, that is um, an important part of my life's work. And then obviously the environmental work, which was a lot of what she did, uh, keeps me passionate about trees and I, I continue to keep a little bit attached now through the World Resources Institute on, on the forestry work. But I think those two are, are dry, driven by just my close connection with my mother later in my life. As you see, it was not, it was 12 years, say, say 12 years ago that I, that I really started working back with her. I guess the apple for not falling far from the tree is an apt uh, sort of a... <laughs> it could be. I know it can roll down the hill anytime. Though. <laughs> and, and what are you most excited about uh, with your foundation? I'm very excited about seeing the impact of work like this that is so innovative. It's new, uh, certainly here. I'm excited about the partnerships that are coming because that means they see something. You know, sometimes you start something with, with uh, your friends, with others, about the, the board of the foundation fully believing in this work. But then you're not sure whether, you know, it's new stuff. It's not, it's not the usual. And is it really the case that personal leadership and character building can shift mindsets and, and begin to make a turn on this integrity corruption story, which for me has been really quite uh, uh, disturbing. So I'm very curious to see and excited to see how this uh, work is transforming young people's minds. Hmm. And have you and seen my own, by the way, I, of course, those values yeah. are for yeah. me. I feel they're part of my own uh, journey and my own uh, uh, exploration of myself and trying to figure out how I can be a better version of myself. Uh, that's awesome. And have you seen uh, any like fundamental changes in any of the sort of kids that have 
you know, being part of it? No, we are starting. So we've been in development. We are now completing the curriculum. So in January, we start the work. But the schools we are starting to work with are very excited. And uh, um, the kids, I'm sure, will enjoy these uh, lessons. They're very different from what their usual classroom um, experience. But uh, we'll see. I mean, I have no idea. Uh-huh. Well, that's great. Well, you know, we've been talking quite a lot lately about education one way or another. And, you know, these kind of initiatives are, this is how it starts, you know, like kids need to be learning how to have life skills like this. This is real education, you know, and, and so we firmly believe that, you know, the more initiatives that spring up like yours, uh, it will create a little bit of a groundswell for for changes in the schooling system at large. So, um, yeah, keep up the good work. It's, it's really, so. really exciting. Yeah. And um, so if people want to get involved with some of your projects or find out more, uh, maybe you could point them in the, 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 the direction. Yes, our website, actually, that should be literally morphing as we speak. It's the, the new content going up, uh, wangarimathai.org. Uh, is really where to find us, uh, and especially with this work on the youth. We need all people interested in this area, innovations, uh, interesting exercises, possibly even uh, people doing similar work that we can connect with. But uh, Mm. we welcome all. And of course, anyone who wants to fund this work is also welcome. Mm. Of course, yeah. yeah. Um, Just before we sort of finish up, I've given you like an hour and a half to think of ridiculously human. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, do we Why even have, <laughs> you know, ridiculously human might actually be considered crazy. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, so my mother was so often called Kirimo. Kirimo. Which is, Kirimo is the crazy one. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I, I mean, yeah, I just want to say this has been th- the most inspiring chat I've had. Like you, you really, oh, it's really nice. You, you know how to tell a great story, <laughs> and more than that, what you, what you've done first of all, what your mom has done, and what you doing and you're putting in place now is just absolutely brilliant and thank you you, you've like given me this fire back inside me you Mm. know like to go gareth you need to really get involved more in in two things particularly that i'm super passionate about and one of them is nature and the environment and the other one is the youth because we have to look after the youth we especially now like you know with social media and whatever the, 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 they're getting the wrong message is distorted you know what i mean like or what is important in in mm-hmm. life and it's so important that we get in there at a young age to help them you know right. and it, it takes people like us that are a bit older to to kind of explain to them what happened you know who were the good people and why were they good and this is these are the values that are important and what you are doing with the foundation is just so incredible and like I'm so excited. I'm even thinking, gee, how can I fly out to Kenya and maybe, you know, spend a bit of time out there and, and do a class with the kids oh, and, and get nice. involved yeah. and whatever. Like I literally, that's how, that's how sort of passionate I am. And that's yeah. just, you know, a, an hour and 15 minute conversation with you because yeah. of the way you tell a story and you spread a message. Oh, and, and it's just like, you can see it in your facial expressions. Yeah. You know, it's something you're so passionate about. And I, and I, yeah. Yeah, I really feel like that. So, yeah, I just thank want to say you. massive thank you for coming on the podcast. You really have sort of inspired me personally. And I'm just so excited for you, of, you know, and how this sort of pans out. It's, it's really an amazing initiative. So, yeah. And just briefly from my side, Anjira, you know, I, I, Gary said it so well because I feel exactly the same. It's like, I literally am so, like, I, I can't believe how inspiring your story is and you are. So literally like just keep this up because it's, it's such important work, the youth integrity. There's so many important factors that, that are, are being touched on by your work. And 
like Gareth said, and like you said, it's just coming back to the basics. What are the real things that are actually important to us as human beings? And we totally, and myself included, you totally just lose sight of what's what, like, what it's all about, you know? And, and so thanks for that reminder today. And um, so thanks for coming on today. And thank we you. can't wait to see where you're heading into the future. Oh, thank you both. Thank you both for the opportunity to share. And I love chatting, so as you can tell. I can't stop. <laughs> but it was, a, it was so much fun. And I really am grateful for, especially your cutting edge uh, work and, and continue it. And we'll add you to our, our mailing list. And when you decide you want to come anytime in January onwards, uh, we would welcome you. Thank you again thank for, you. The, for the opportunity. Wow, yeah. No, wow, thank you. That's amazing chat. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks, great. guys. No, thank you hey, so much. Have yeah. yourself a good and we'll let you know. We'll keep Irene in the loop with when we're launching and that kind of thing. And so you can have a listen as well. And uh and we really and appreciate it. It was a marvelous chat. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Nice day, nice. guys. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. See you later. Bye bye. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, 